It is said these prophets foresaw the First and Second World Wars, predicted natural catastrophes, the rise and fall of empires, and the end of the world. From the ancient Mayan astrologers to the legendary Nostradamus to the celebrated visionaries of today, we are going to visit the past and the present's most extraordinary prophets and seers. Four, three, two. We'll hear their most spine-chilling forecasts. There is a great purification coming. Times of dire cataclysm, death, devastation. And observe the man who outshines them all. Blager Casey made some extraordinary predictions beyond what we could imagine. He would read the body as though he were an x-ray machine. Edgar Casey was clearly the most gifted psychic of, of the 20th century. From ancient times to today, the mysteries of the future have been explored by many, but interpreted by only a select few. Prophecy has a rich and controversial history, but its most celebrated figure is, without a doubt, Michel de Notre Dame, better known to us as Nostradamus. He was seen as a prophet of doom because of his dark visions of the future. But Nostradamus used astrology, magic, and medicine to look across space and time at all things. Nostradamus was a very famous person in his own time, even before he started writing the things that made him famous. He was the court physician and astrologer to the Queen of France. Primarily a physician, Nostradamus was a Renaissance man in many ways. Over 500 years after his birth, he is chiefly remembered for his book, Le Prophétie, a collection of 1,000 visionary quatrains that he wrote between 1555 and 1558. He planned 10 volumes, 1,000 predictions, of which only 942 survive. And they basically look at the you know, profound flows and inclinations of the future. They're not written in stone. There are hundreds of prophecies that indicate alternative futures. Nostradamus's material is clearly clothed in symbology and arcane references and open to different interpretations. But many of the predictions proved eerily accurate, especially those that were fulfilled in Nostradamus' own lifetime. The most famous of them predicted the death of the King of France four years before it occurred. In July 1559, Henry II confronted Gabriel Count of Montgomery in a jousting tournament. The young lion, he will surmount the old one on the field of combat in single battle told. Both men bore shields emblazoned with lions. The younger lion, Count Montgomery, did not lower his jousting stick soon enough, which pierced through the golden visor of the king he will pierce his eyes through a cage all golden. Count Montgomery, his jousting stick split into large splinters, one wounding the king in the throat, another just behind the eye, blinding him and going into his brain. The final line gives us the denouement, the epilogue to all of this. Two wounds become one, then dying in cruel death's cold. The king lingered for 10 agonizing days, and he finally died from peritonitis of the brain. It is thought possible that Nostradamus predicted the French Revolution. From the enslaved people, songs, chants, and demands, in the future by such headless idiots, these will be taken as divine utterances. The ascendancy and fall of Napoleon, from the simple soldier, he will aspire to empire. From a short robe, he will aspire to the long. And Hitler's rise to power. The greater part of the battlefield will be against Hister, when the child of Germany observes nothing. He also had ominous visions of the new millennium. The year of the great seventh number is accomplished, appearing at the time of the games of slaughter, 
not far from the age of the great millennium when the dead will come out of their graves. This bleak vision of our times has not come to pass, at least not yet, but Nostradamus continues to command great respect as a prophet. Why people get so convinced that Nostradamus knew what he was talking about is that once you set an interpretation on a given quatrain and you think you know the historical event that it refers to, it's really hard to see that there could have been other alternatives that would have worked just as well. Nostradamus was not unique. Across the English Channel in Knaresborough in Yorkshire, another seer was also experiencing similar vivid visions of the future. Brother Shipton was a contemporary of Nostradamus. He was born in the late 1400s and died in 1561, just about five years before Nostradamus. In verse, Mother Shipton is said to have given detailed descriptions of a future that was yet to unfold. And now a word in uncouth rhyme of what shall be in future time. Around the world men's thoughts will fly, quick as the twinkling of an eye. Beneath the water men shall walk, shall ride, shall sleep, shall even talk. For in these wondrous far-off days, the women shall adopt a craze to dress like men and trousers wear, and cut off their locks of hair. It is said she also predicted the Second World War and the end of the world. In 1926, build houses light with straw and sticks, for then shall mighty wars be planned, and fire and sword shall sweep the land. For those who live the century through, in fear and trembling this shall do, for storms shall rage and oceans roar when Gabriel stands on sea and shore, and as he blows his wondrous horn, old worlds shall die and new be born. Was she foreseeing the future, or simply imagining it? Prophets, if they were archers, what they would do is shoot an arrow into the wall and then have somebody paint a target around it. They let out this vague kind of statement that could be read multiple ways, and they rely on their hearers to put the interpretation into it that fits best for them. There is another seer whose chilling predictions continue to echo down the centuries. He is Saint Malachi, canonized in 1190. Malachi was a reforming Catholic prelate born in Armagh in 1094. On a visit to Rome, he was struck by a vision. Before him appeared a series of Latin phrases identifying the 111 popes who would rule the Catholic Church until the end of time. He uttered 111 Latin mottos, which are supposed to represent the nature, the name or destiny or the coat of arms of every pope until Judgment Day. Many of the phrases are considered too precise to be the results of chance. John XXIII, the 107th Pope in the prophecy, is referred to as Pastor et Nortam, priest and sailor. Before becoming Pope in 1958, he was the Patriarch of Venice. Paul VI is Flos Floram, flower among flowers. His coat of arms is a lily among lilies. John Paul II, who is called De Labor Solis in the prophecies, which means the sun's eclipse, the sun's labor. He is the only pontiff on the list that was born on an eclipse and later entombed during an eclipse. And the 111th, the final pope in the prophecy? De Gloria Olive, from the glory of the olive. That's the current Benedict XVI. At the end of the list, Malachi is said to have uttered a final doom-laden phrase, this one unnumbered. During the final persecution, the seat of the Holy Roman Church will be occupied by Peter the Roman, who will feed the sheep in many tribulations, after which the seven-hilled city will be destroyed and the terrible judge will judge his people. The end. Is Malachi describing the end of the Catholic Church or the end of the world? Is Peter the Roman the last pope who will follow the current pontiff, Benedict XVI? Some experts consider that since the motto is unnumbered, they are actually one and the same. Malachi, Nostradamus and Mother Shipton all predicted events that have since become history. But who are today's forecasters and what can they tell us about our faith? 8, 15. 22, 29, 
Robert Zola is a medievalist astrologer, a modern Nostradamus. For 30 years, he has been studying the stars in order to decipher the future, and he's made some predictions of surprising accuracy. America will have a new president, and he will be in the stamp of Bush, a younger, more inexperienced version from the same house. There is an increasing threat to the U.S. citizens, and this is particularly so on the eastern seaboard. If the U.S. does not cease acting incompetently, it will invite the depredations of adventurers such as Osama bin Laden and Saddam. The greatest period of danger is in September 2001. Sheer coincidence, or did the stars actually foretell the events? Number is actually the key to astrology. The sequence of integers between one and nine, and later the addition of zero, was seen by some of the ancients as being the basic principles of whereby being became articulated into something. Astrology rests upon this kind of thinking. The signs themselves come down in number. Why it seems to work is an enigma, but many ancient civilizations fervently believed that the stars and nature held the answers to the mysteries of life. The Mayans and the Hopis, as virtually all indigenous people throughout the world, were very connected to the sky. The Mayans in particular were very sophisticated in noticing the rhythms of the heavens and building elaborate calendars with great accuracy. The Mayan calendar, which was designed to calculate the progress of the seasons, was also a tool of prophecy. The calendar ends abruptly on the 21st of December, 2012 and Mayan prophecy describes bleak events surrounding that time. The face of the sun will be extinguished because of the Great Tempest. In a similar way, another Native American culture, the Hopis, have a prophecy that there would be times of great destruction, a day of great purification. These are the signs that great destruction is here. The world shall rock to and fro. The white man will battle people in other lands, those who possess the first light of wisdom. The fourth world shall end soon, and the fifth world will begin. The Hopi Indians, in their final warnings, are saying the world has been destroyed and reborn at least four times. Many native traditions say four times, and we're entering the fifth time. But according to many historians, these common themes in prophecy are nothing more than the inevitable patterns and rhythms of history. All prophets are predicting similar sorts of things. They're essentially talking about how history sort of repeats itself and you'll get the same sorts of things uh, in, in cycles. Perhaps. But there is one man whose prophetic and predictive talents continue to baffle even the most skeptical of critics. With only a smattering of education, he revealed secrets of the past. He predicted wars, diagnosed and cured illnesses, and saw cataclysmic changes to our planet that only scientists could have described. And he did it all in his sleep. For 43 years of his life, Edgar Cayce demonstrated a mystifying ability to put himself in a trance and give people around him detailed information about virtually anything they asked relating to the present, the past, or the future. Edgar Cayce is probably the most profoundly important clairvoyant of all time. He was clearly the most gifted psychic of, of the 20th century. Casey predicted the Second World War, the death of presidents, the future of medicine. He also diagnosed illnesses and all in his sleep. His psychic readings, all 14,306 of them, are archived and catalogued at the Association for Research and Enlightenment in Virginia. They constitute the largest collection of psychic material from a single source in the world. Edgar Cayce didn't give 10, 20, 500 readings in his career. He gave 14,000. Think of a Las Vegas stage performer having to come up with a different routine twice a day, every day for 45 years. It's just not possible. Edgar Cayce gave readings about many, many different subjects. Nostradamus wasn't quite as eclectic. 
But like Nostradamus, Casey was much sought after in his lifetime, and like his French counterpart, he also remained extremely modest about his gift. Both of them were men who were deeply committed to a life of compassion and service to others. Both were very interested in health and healing. Nostradamus was a physician. Edgar Casey was an intuitive diagnostic physician of sorts. Edgar Casey and Nostradamus both started as healers, but later became more famous as prophets. Edgar Casey's fateful journey through life started in 1877 near Hopkinsville, a small town of tobacco farmers in rural Kentucky. Edgar Casey's family was typical of middle-class American rural people at the turn of the 20th century. They made their living primarily from the production of dark tobacco, wheat and corn and livestock. They were church-going people on Sunday, a straightforward, dignified people, uh, the men of whom were certainly given to the heavy use of tobacco and occasional strong drink. Casey was a seriously odd child. He, he was not the kind of child you would wish on any two parents. As a child, he was surprised to discover that other children didn't have the same sort of experiences that he had. As a boy, Edgar often had visions as he sat in the woods reading his Bible. After his grandfather drowned in their pond, he reported seeing him regularly around the farm. The child was also said to have had the uncanny ability to memorize entire books by sleeping on them. Had he been born in different circumstances, and not a, a little rural community, Edgar could very easily have been you know, sold as a circus act. He was completely surrounded by people who loved him, people who protected him. Edgar's most extraordinary talent, which earned him the nickname Sleeping Prophet, surfaced several years later when he was in his early 20s. While working as an insurance salesman, he developed severe chronic laryngitis. Unable to speak, Casey took a job as a photographer. In the dark room, he wouldn't be required to talk much. But the malady persisted, and he finally decided to seek help. At that time, Edgar had had some uh, friendship association with Dr. Al Lane, a homeopathic physician. And Dr. Lane suggested to young Edgar, why not self-impose hypnosis? What happened next sealed Edgar Casey's destiny. It was on the 30th of March, 1901, in a two-story brick house on West 7th Street in Hopkinsville, Kentucky that Edgar Casey lay upon a couch in a contemplative and meditative situation and self-imposed hypnosis. And then, before his parents and maybe a few others in the room, astounded everyone by describing what was wrong with his throat and prescribing treatment for it. The first reading, March 30th, 1901. Out of a deep sleep, Casey had spoken in a clear voice and described both his ailment and its cure. Soon, doctors and patients were coming from far and wide to be diagnosed and made well by the man with the X-ray eyes. One of the amazing things about Edgar Casey's health readings is the piercing nature of his vision into an individual's body. He would read the body as though he were an X-ray machine and uh, the terminology that he used was quite medical. It's quite amazing. In 1905, Casey told surgeons how to mend the badly broken leg of a local man, George Dalton, by inserting a nail into the break. The doctors had said Dalton would never walk again. He did. To our knowledge, that was the first time in medical history of the use of a nail. In the summer of 1911, when doctors told Casey his wife Gertrude would soon die of tuberculosis, she followed her husband's treatment directions and quickly recovered. Casey's fame as a healer spread rapidly. In the New York Times, he received rave reviews from doctors. One wrote, his psychologic terms would do credit to any professor of nervous anatomy. While in his normal state, he is an illiterate man, especially along the lines of medicine, surgery or pharmacy, of which he knows nothing. The predictions were amazingly precise in their detail, but his method was simplicity itself. It wasn't anything mysterious. He would simply lie down on a couch. He would, if he had a tie, a collar on, he'd loosen his collar, loosen his shoelaces, and just cross his hands over his stomach and just relax. 
there was a window, maybe 30 seconds, maybe 60 seconds, when his eyes began to flutter. And it was at that moment that you could put a question to Edgar Cayce. All he had to know was the name of the person the reading was for and where he was at the time of the reading. Could be in California or Kalamazoo, it didn't matter. Strangely, whether he gave a diagnosis or predicted the future, Casey forgot all about it as soon as he opened his eyes. He didn't remember anything. He didn't remember anything that uh, he said at the reading. And soon some unscrupulous clients caught on. People would slip in a question about who's going to win a horse race or what's going to happen in the stock market. And he would answer them much to their profit. As clients got rich, Casey started to suffer from inexplicable migraine headaches. Where there were selfish purposes involved, it was as if the radar screen got fuzzy. He couldn't tune in as clearly or as accurately. It made him ill or made him upset stomach. He just said, I'm through. I'm not doing this anymore. In 1912, with Gertrude and his little son Hugh Lynn in tow, a disillusioned Casey left Hopkinsville and the predictions behind him and moved to Selma in Alabama, where he resumed work as a photographer. He continued that work until my brother dropped a match in a partially filled can of flashlight powder and burned his face terribly. And all the doctors said, well, he'll never see again, and my brother asked my father for a reading. Two weeks later, after following his father's instructions to the letter, Hugh Lynn's eye was as good as new. Dad realized that he could help people again and that he thought that maybe that's what he ought to do. But he made it a rule that mother would be the one who asked the questions, so nothing could happen like happened in Hopkinsville. Edgar Casey was poised to discover new amazing abilities. His spine-chilling visions were about to turn him into the most famous prophet of the 20th century. In the 1920s, Europe was still reeling from the disastrous consequences of the First World War. But across the Atlantic, America was enjoying its ascendancy to global superpower status. It was a time of frivolity and fun and rapid social change. Big corporations were forming, technology was on the rise, and we were changing from an earlier, simpler people to a much more complicated society. Edgar Cayce represents, as do great actors or poets, an individual who speaks out of the collective need of his time and place and culture. Clients consulted Cayce about everything under the sun. Oil prospectors asked him where to locate their oil wells. Some of the most remarkable readings before 1923 are oil readings, geophysical readings. Edgar Cayce gives almost a foot-by-foot -foot breakdown of the geophysical conditions for a particular site, and invariably he was right, he was dead on. Great minds also visited the sleeping prophet. Thomas Edison received readings uh, on the nature of electricity. Woodrow Wilson, President of the United States, who was suffering from a heart condition. We know that George Gershwin received readings. We know that Nelson Rockefeller received readings. Edgar Cayce was extraordinarily eclectic in his psychic work, but his predictions on world affairs, complete with dates and vivid descriptions of events, are a testament to its accuracy. Some of the world affairs readings are absolutely scary. It was like he was reading the headlines four years in advance, consistently. He's under trance in 1925, asked by a client how the future of business will be, and he says, better pull your stocks out. In the adverse forces that will come then in 1929, care should be taken, lest this be taken from the entity. Casey foresaw the onset of the Great Depression four years before it occurred, and then, in 1931, he accurately predicted the end of the hard times. In the spring of 33 will be the real definite improvements. The only thing we have to fear is fear itself. Now, of course, that's the New Deal. 
when we did slowly start to get out of the uh, depression. Casey also made several predictions about the oncoming world war. In 1935, Edgar Casey was giving a reading to a 29-year-old freight agent, and the individual wanted to know about affairs of an international nature. Casey predicted that there would be an alliance between the Austrians, the Germans, and the Japanese. He says in the reading, and unless there is interference from the divine, the whole world will be set on fire. In 1935, no one had any idea that any of this was about to happen. The League of Nations was still in being. Another war seemed implausible. And yet... Edgar Casey seems to have had a psychic sensitivity to the coming of World War II. There were certainly things in the news that were the clouds of this coming war, but he targeted the time in which it might begin to occur and even its end, and many of the dynamics that went on during those war years. Casey also foresaw social upheavals that would develop long after his death in 1945. Now is the time to rise from the dark and desolate valley of segregation to the sunlit path of racial justice. Edgar Casey's accuracy with predictions is also um, suggested by his statements about how mob rule could potentially happen in the United States, particularly if there weren't some social changes. Ye ought to have a division in thy own land, before ye have the second of the presidents that next will not live through his office. A mob rule. In April 1945, Roosevelt died in office. Kennedy was assassinated in November 1963 at a time when the civil rights movement was exploding. That one instance points to how important it is to see that Edgar Cayce was also a commentator on social affairs. He said that unless there would be a kind of leveling that would come in society, that there couldn't be one rule for those who were rich and privileged and a different rule for those that were the have-nots, that we were in for tremendous difficult changes in our culture. With this thing, we will be able to work together, to pray together, to struggle together, to go to jail together, to stand up for freedom together. Casey was not a Republican or a Democrat. He wasn't trying to advocate any particular political agenda, but he clearly had a moral sense about something that needed to be achieved if we were to fulfill our destiny as a nation. Casey's visions would be lost to us today if it wasn't for Gladys Davis. She was a young stenographer Casey engaged in 1923 to record every word he uttered while in a trance. She was much more than a stenographer. She really completed the work. And it's because of Gladys Davis that we have the readings today. I felt an instant attraction to this man. I just trusted him. One day during a reading, he said a string of words, so I was wondering whether he, whether I should put uh, a dash or a comma or uh, just how to uh, word this. And uh, over there asleep on the couch, I mean, his eyes closed, he said, put a comma between these. <laughs> After she took the reading, she then typed it up into a copy that she would send to the person who had the reading. In the interest of confidentiality, all the names of the people having readings were removed and numbers were inserted. It made no difference to Casey whether his clients were paupers or princes. He never charged for a reading, relying instead on donations, a decision that weighed heavily on his family. We struggled financially, yes, uh, all the time. My mother was frequently wondering what she was going to buy for groceries next week because if he got two or three readings in a row and he had a little money, he'd buy a load of topsoil for the garden or he'd buy a new fruit tree. I think my father gave these readings because he felt it helped people and that's what he wanted to do. Casey's great ambition was to open a hospital where his patients could receive the treatments he prescribed in his medical readings. In 1925 he moved to Virginia Beach where three years later the hospital opened. It closed in 1931 in the middle of the Great Depression. After the hospital had folded and, uh, you know, he'd lost everything, I heard him say that was probably the saddest time of his life. But in good times and in bad, Edgar Cayce never lost his prophetic touch. In fact, 
Another set of readings, which had issued from his sleeping form in the 1920s, proved so astounding that they still resonate today and may yet turn modern history upside down. For 43 years of his life, Edgar Cayce would lie down on a couch, place his hands on his solar plexus, and fall into a self-induced trance. In this state, he traveled through space and time, foretelling wars, diagnosing illnesses, and, in some of his most intriguing readings, rewriting history. When we consider Edgar Cayce's predictions, it's also interesting to look at some of the retrocognitive statements he made, looking back into history and making statements about things you wouldn't find in the history book. Cayce seemed to know secrets about the past that only high-tech instruments and years of excavating could reveal. Long before the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered in 1947, he spoke of an ancient sect of Judaism, the Essenes, which experts of the time believed was made up exclusively of men. Edgar Cayce spoke about the Essenes as a community uh, that included men, women, and children. The experts remained dubious, but in the 1950s, years after Cayce's death, skeletons of Essene women were unearthed near the site where the scrolls were found. With geology, there are some interesting things as well. Casey suggested that at one time, the Nile River flowed in the opposite direction and actually emptied directly into the Atlantic Ocean. Amazingly, in the 1980s, satellite images from the space shuttle revealed unknown river valleys beneath the driest parts of the Sahara. More imaging and on-site exploration have demonstrated that the Nile may indeed have once flowed through the desert and into the Atlantic. In Edgar Cayce's lifetime, much of what he said about lost civilizations, ancient worlds, was regarded as science fiction. It really wasn't until this century, and literally the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls, that people have begun to look much harder and realistically at these readings as perhaps, well, maybe these aren't so far-fetched. Probably the most intriguing readings Cayce gave were on the subject of the lost land of Atlantis. Atlantis, from Edgar Cayce's perspective, was the first great Eden on the Earth. It predates the Eden that we uh, know of between the Tigris and the Euphrates, the Eden of Adam and Eve. Edgar Cayce saw Atlantis as a massive continent in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. And at the time, the individuals that populated the area had a deep understanding of the forces of the universe and could actually harness some of these powers to use devices such as flying machines and crystals and so forth. But according to the readings, the Atlanteans abused their power over nature. As a result, Atlantis disappeared in a cataclysmic disaster some 10,000 years ago. Casey's most specific prophecy in terms of date asserted a part of Atlantis would rise again in 1968. It didn't. But that year, a strange formation known as the Bimini Road was discovered in the Bahamas. Most geologists think it's beach rock. Beach rock is rock that fractures parallel to the shore. Well, this is parallel to the shore, but the end of it curves around in a kind of a J shape. So that's unusual. No conclusive evidence has yet been amassed that proves Atlantis lies beneath the Bahamas. But according to Casey, Bimini isn't our only link to the lost continent. Before the final destruction, he said, Atlanteans hid records of their earliest history in other locations. One was in the Yucatan Peninsula. The other was off the right front paw of the Sphinx in Egypt. In the early 1990s, Dr. Robert Schock, a professor of geology at Boston University, conducted geological and seismic surveys on the Sphinx. I was not in the business to support Edgar Cayce or any other, I'll call him psychic or prophet. I really knew nothing about him other than his name. Schock and his team were about to make an interesting discovery. We were able to model what was underneath the Great Sphinx. We found under and in front of the left paw of the Sphinx what I believe is a major chamber, maybe up to 25 meters below the surface. Based on its regularity, it looks like it was human carved. 
And not only is it definitely there, but it seems to have something in it. The way it resonated, the way it ringed, seems to indicate there's something in the chamber. Is it the Atlanteans' Hall of Records that Casey spoke of? No one has explored the matter further, and as fascinating as they are, Casey's Atlantis prophecies have so far not been vindicated. However, it is possible that Casey's method and not his material will have the most far-reaching effect on our understanding of ourselves and the world we inhabit. In fact, he suggested that with practice, we could all do what he did. I do not believe there is a single individual that does not possess this same ability I have. If they would only be willing to pay the price of detachment from self-interest that it takes to develop those abilities. Casey was even able to describe where he got the information that came to him in trance. He said it came from the subconscious mind of the individual he was reading for, and from the Akashic Records, a universal source of knowledge that holds all the pasts, presents, and unfolding futures of mankind. Edgar Casey said, ultimately, when you view it from the highest dimension, there is no time and no space. There is no future and no past. It all is occurring in one fascinating moment of expression, but time is an illusion that has purpose. Casey's readings also suggested that we could have an impact on the future. This radical notion was shared by Nostradamus. Edgar Casey and Nostradamus both shared the belief that the future was malleable, changeable. It's also true that if you are a prophet, you're also a propagandist. You're trying to persuade, often, the future to change. Why would Casey want the future to be changed, and what cataclysmic prophecies did he make for the third millennium? Edgar Casey made some extraordinary and spectacular earth change predictions, something that would be catastrophic, probably even beyond what we could imagine. From Nostradamus to the Mayan priests, prophets and prophetic traditions the world over warn of cataclysmic planet changes that will soon be upon us. The ancient Mayans had a sense that there would come a time, about in these times in which we're living now, that would include tremendous destruction. They speak about the day of the withered fruit and the great tempest, things that sound rather scary. The Hopi Indians speak of trees dying and dramatic changes in the weather that will bring in the day of purification. Nostradamus speaks of the dead rising from their graves and Mother Shipton warns, Storms shall rage and oceans roar, old worlds shall die and new be born. Casey's predictions for the new millennium are every bit as dire as all the other prophets who preceded him. Edgar Casey made some extraordinary and spectacular earth change predictions. Probably the biggest one was that the rotational axis of the earth would change. And that's something that would be catastrophic, probably even beyond what we could imagine if that took place literally. If the tilt axis of the earth shifted slightly, the entire mass of the earth would have to reconfigure itself. It would shift ocean basins, it would shift where valleys are, where mountains are. Some of Casey's visions of the future are truly terrifying. He speaks of Japan going into the ocean, inundations for southeastern United States, perhaps in a very slow way, but a permanent kind of inundation. He also said the American East Coast would not be spared. Portions of the now east coast of New York, or New York City itself, will in the main disappear. This will be another generation, though, here, while the southern portions of Carolina, Georgia, these will disappear. This will be much sooner. He also suggests that Europe would change either geologically or climatologically in the twinkling of an eye. Casey actually foresaw these um, as part of the shifting of the poles. And he stated that the Great Lakes would flow down through the Mississippi Valley system and from there flow right into the Gulf. Casey, who knew nothing about plate tectonics, said signs within the Earth would warn us of this coming shift of the poles. The most dramatic predictions that Edgar Casey made is that there would be the onset of major Earth changes that would escalate in activity from 1958 on through uh, 1998 
from that period on, these trends, they would escalate again, then we would know that the pole shift was coming. There will be the upheavals in the Arctic and in the Antarctic that will make for the eruption of volcanoes in the torrid areas. And this will begin in those periods in 58 to 98. Volcanic activity events are increasing. But the torrid zone activity has increased along with general world increase by something like 500% in the last 50 years. Casey also predicted a surge in violent storms and earthquakes in this period. In the last 10 years, hurricane activity in the Atlantic has been at its highest since records began, and an increasing number of earthquakes are being detected around the globe. In 1999, German researchers measured more than 200 earthquakes in a period of seven months above the Arctic Circle. R. Casey, Mother Shipton, Nostradamus, and the Mayan and Hopi Indians before them, reading from the same hymn sheet. People from different cultures seem to have been able to tune into a kind of universal mind, at the same level that Nostradamus and Edgar Casey seem to have been able to tune into also. Is the world as we know it about to end? Some disaster with our skies, with our crops, with our rising oceans, they all can basically agree on that. They may emphasize one aspect more than others, but they all share the fact that we are entering a period of evolutionary crisis. So many different prophetic traditions have talked about times of destruction, times of dire cataclysm, death, devastation. More than anything, those predictions are a wake-up call for all of us as individuals, as a nation, as a world, to look at our relationship to the earth, to nature, and to our relationship with each other. As dire as his prophecies concerning the planet appear, Casey himself believed in living in the present. He also believed, like Nostradamus and other prophets before him, that mankind plays a crucial role in how the future will unfold. In 1939, as Casey had predicted, a second world war broke out. And in 1941, as America became entangled in the conflict, more and more people wrote to him or went to him, asking about the fate of loved ones who were fighting abroad. Edgar, in his own readings, was remanded to give not more than two a day, one in the morning and one in the afternoon, because each psychic reading was emotionally draining to a system. Well, Edgar Casey could not say no to people, and that ultimately brought his downfall, because by the summer of 1944, he was giving seven and eight readings a day. In September 1944, fatigued and depleted, Edgar Casey suffered a stroke, he died on the 3rd of January, 1945, in Virginia Beach. He was buried in his hometown of Hopkinsville, Kentucky. Outside the cemetery, a bronze plaque stands as a testament to his work. To many people, he was more than a prophet. Relegating Edgar Cayce to the place of someone who simply predicted the future makes Edgar Cayce an event. And in my opinion, the material is so helpful, so valuable, that it's much more a source of information that help people in the here and now. He isn't any one thing. That is, you can't stick him in a box and label it mystic. You can't stick him in a box and label him psychic. You can't stick him in a box and label him prophet. At the end of the day, Edgar Cayce's readings are not about whether he was right or wrong about Egyptian or Atlantean history, or whether there even was that kind of history. I think at the end of the day, what matters is that he helps us to better understand who we are and why we're here. Today, the psychic materials of Edgar Cayce continue to provide insights into almost every subject under the sun. Whatever he did and however he did it, Cayce, like all the great seers before him, left us a vision of what our future could be. Whether or not that future will unfold remains to be seen.